Message from Garcia de la Concha to Albert Einstein. It is not conceivable, illustrious master, how your overbearing genius has not been indignant at a nature so derangedly conceived. End quote. This message from Garcia de la Concha to Albert Einstein was read at a public ceremony at the Central University of Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic on November 15, 1929, and transmitted by radio to America and Europe. The eminent mathematician and great philosopher Herman Wiles says in his work, What is Matter? Quote, the representation of the electron as a rigid substantial sphere can also be transported to the special theory of relativity. In this way, it serves as the foundation of the electronic theory of Lorentz. But rigorously, of course, only in the case of limiting the movements to the uniform and rectilinear. End quote. I understand all of this, and that is what I'm asking you, as if I'm asking the most illustrious genius of our civilization at the moment, that the eminent physicist to whom I've referred confuses as the less demanding spirit clearly discovers that special relativity with which it is fulfilled in the three-dimensional sense of the field, a relativity conceived within that ideology is contrary to the thought of genius to nature itself because then time would not have any variation in the electromagnetic exchange if the dualistic theory were a real fact of nature if the dualistic theory were a real fact of nature it could not be verified there would not be in a word that excess of inertia by which the electronic field is continuously regenerated by that magnetism so to speak illusory of space what is necessary has been fulfilled it is true so that electronic rigidity can have an ideological effect but in the mind in spirit I mean cultivated in the principles of modern science I cannot conceive it within a relativistic domain to the same extent that Professor Whale accepts it in his quoted paragraph in my opinion, there's only one intellectual truth, or rather, if you will, an invention of the imagination that intelligence and good sense must reject as incongruent. That enclosure is within the prevailing modern concept, a Euclidean field, where an eminently classical mechanics is fulfilled. On the other hand, the conservation of energy within that framework that is so capricious, so absurd, and in which you still have some responsibility, illustrious genius, cannot be fulfilled under the ontological auspices of that universal compensation continually engendered by the two factors of his marvelous theory, space and time. First, the time factor, which for me is, if not for you, my distinguished teacher, the generating factor par excellence would be marked by a constant rhythm within a permanent space, always the same, I mean throughout the three-dimensional width of the fields. Within a similar repeated continuum, both energies, electric and magnetic, would have the same behavior, the same dynamics, that is, the same form and identical density. They would be of the same nature, and both logically electrical. It only seems that in a classical medium, the generation of the magnetic field is impossible, or at least that it is of the same electronic essence and of dynamic qualities as the central or primitive nucleus whose movement has engendered it from infinite depths, from nothingness in the middle of a space empty of any substantial principle. It is not conceivable as his overbearing genius has not been indignant at such an insanely conceived nature. That is the absurdity of that relativity, of that relativity so improperly called special, and the incongruity at the same time of having been engendered by a uniform movement. It seems nothing more than that Professor Well, whom I worship with respect and admiration, of which I'm not sorry for saying 
since I've made his achievements as a wise man and philosopher worth them with all the merit they have in a preferential place of my unpublished work, The Cosmic, it does not seem, I repeat, but that the wise professor forgot that the three-dimensional coordinates are functions that have the same dynamic behavior within the moving field that they express. There's no doubt that in the midst of this absurdity of constant relativity or no variations, a dielectrical field has emerged, contributed, it seems, by some divine fiat that the reason and good judgment with which science has culminated in this moment of history they must reject. The conception of architecture similar for energy, given the case that the conversion of the real principle were possible, does not allow physical processes of any kind. Within this concept, it is clear the world of energetic phenomenality, phen phenomenality would not have any activity. The equilibrium, the static, without any acceleration would then be the only prevailing law. I have reasoned with all the force of truth or with the best logic that was possible for me, eminent genius, not with the sole purpose of criticizing the wise Professor Wales, but rather with the idea of bringing before my conscience the reality of an inconceivable fact such as that which entails the conception of a classical nature which by its very reason of being, or general ontology, excludes itself from all gravitation within the universe that contains it. The parabolic mechanics, then, of the Euclidean worlds and spaces is pure phantagorium, phantasmagoria of the disorientated imagination. In this virtue, I conclude but with the precise and categorical conclusion that the electromagnetic theory is inapplicable to the universal gravitation of the fields engendered by the uniform movement, or similarly, that the entire Euclidean continuum excludes itself from all natural mechanics because, according to my work, the form or the geometric types of all natural mechanics is determined by the space wave or the, or the unevenness of times through the entire continuum of three-dimensional fields. The application, I repeat, of the electromagnetic theory of the relativistic phenomenon verified within a variable field or simply of energy implicit or that necessity for that necessity, an ontology of the cosmic structure conceived in those terms, that any change introduced in a system of coordinates is contained in a transformation that will have to be by force and by law, all the more dielectric, the more Euclidean the spirit wants it to be in its eagerness for distance. It is an absurdity, and who knows if the most beautiful within the apparent realities it is because it is because it only seems that nature has found with it the supreme resource of its gravitational limit within the infinite train that expresses it through the universe always unlimited this would be the last cosmic mooring of any universal centripetal or the initial point in other words the zero of all energetic acceleration as the only cause of gravity and time through the continuum or electromagnetic field. This can only be considered, it is clear, within the narrow limits that only the mind can conceive in the idea of an appropriate reduction within which both fields are equally continuous. However, the genius cannot, no matter how much the vigorous spirit of his great talent wanted it, to transport this event from the electromagnetic fields to the unlimited amplitudes of the great macrocosm. Since every infinitesimal is the infinitely large limit of any second order internal evolution, electromagnetic theory, therefore, in no enclosure, however narrow it may be, will be able to give us the vision of a single field for energetic activities and gravitational phenomena. 
It will always be, even if the ideological borders of the purely small, a heterogeneous field in which each electronic element conditions the space and the magnetic measure of its own field in the pro, pro in the propitious elemental i mean illustrious professor it is rather if you will a field of repulsion through which thought can conceive an infinite plenum to the extent of a static continuity without any natural mechanics that characterizes it without any gravity it is in a word a regular non-homogeneous continuum equivalent to a dielectrical field and where remember well no change of coordinates is possible it is who would doubt it a new aspect of the incompatibility of electromagnetic fields with the universal gravitational force in which all expressions of nature are contained I do not understand, illustrious teacher, how you have been able to assume a responsibility that transcends with so much error in the field of science. The same theory, on the other hand, the dualistic theory of the, magnet, the, of the magnetism and electricity, constrained to its own limits of energy or without any gravitational pretensions, demands, by its own reason of being in existence, the reality of an energetic nucleus or not as if it were the firm, the firm subject of a substance to the extent of the last electronic block restrained by its own field. But this is immediately dispelled by our thoughts of a moment ago. Every differential is the infinitely large limit of any second order internal evolution. This implies illustrious genius, eminent sage of all my respect and culture, that intra-elemental electronic dynamics cannot be accom accomplished without the generation of the corresponding fields and that in the end any space full of its energy will never be able to contain that ash law in a word the electronic the electromagnetic theory is an illusion as long as thought supports the thesis of keeping it in the great book of science as an ontological element in itself and different from the space that expresses it. You have had to, with all the strength and power of your great genius, reject you have had to with all the strength and power of your genius reject the electromagnetic theory more opportunely, or at least not have applied it to the universal gravitation. I, for my part, illustrious professor, have solved in my work, La Cosmica, this problem of nature, which, by the way, until now had been a problem in mind, not resolved outside the spirit of the speculative and accommodating imagination, or in the reality of its own cosmic place. I have supplanted the prevailing dualism in electromagnetic theory and the, and the phantomagorical intervention of forces. The reality of a single field as the medium in which the universe is contained in all its manifestations of, manner, of matter, energy, and space. It is a unique field, there is no doubt, like a covariant three-dimensional continuum in the measure and function of the time that contains it. I repeat, like that cosmic factor of rest, and by which all space in being and depending on said factor, it acquires the kinetic capacity of static acceleration. This is the efficient cause, or rather, if you like, the supreme reason of all movement. Without its own motor through said continuum, behold, who would doubt it, in fact, in the mechanical function of that cosmic gap already referred to in this message, it is the wave of space, the natural trajectory, integrated in all its length and shape by a continuous difference of that factor of rest. My time, which are functionally all the sensible manifestations of nature, it is that every body left to itself does not follow the trajectory from space to matter 
but the one that leads it from one time to another time and that relativistic train essential for the mechanical reality of cosmic processes. Ah, what a pity that I cannot transcribe here everything that my work La Cosmica refers to and demonstrates. But it doesn't matter that the genius must know everything with a single stroke or detail that he discovers about things. My covariant three-dimensional continuum fundamentally expresses that all four-dimensional space is, superf is superfluous or what amounts to the same thing, but it only determines an external circumstance of nature, a coordinate without any graphic representation of the general scheme that originates it from before thought. It is that the rhythm of a clock, for example, is not part of an interior cosmic process with which all space contains itself as a permanent arresting state in the midst of an infinitely continuous variation of time that engenders it to the extent of a function of its own and as the only resource that it has, nature. To determine this class sensibly is a, contr is a contribution from the universal medium to the extent of a differentiation of its geometric shape. A simple field, for example, does not exist in isolation or without an energetic nucleus as its own solidly firm base. Behold, O oh marvels of the great power, how reason can so easily pass from space to energy. It is that this is, at the same time as the essential principle of matter, intrinsically a geometric degeneration contained in a change of time. And we can now say that it has arisen before our consciousness as a contribution of the universal medium, matter, which is always, without a doubt, the predominant cosmic center of an entire cosmic center. It is a field, as I have demonstrated in my work, of constant positive curvature, whose relativistic linch, linkage coefficient for all corners within that simple universe is the same one that, until now, we have believed came from an eminently hyperbolic mechanics. It is that your mechanics, illustrious sage, is not the real thing in the infinite depths of a sky generated by the determination of a simple field, because in truth, such a universe is not, as you have believed, a constant, a constant negative curvature. Every isolated field is therefore an elliptical continuum terminated intramaterially or intracosmic or by intracosmic zones of the predominant center and towards the limitless by the purely spherical. There is for all this between both extremes the supreme as the infinite limit of the elliptical geometry of all the spaces that expresses it through the mechanics of the same name. And since relativity is as it is an event of pure form in the most intimate part of the great universal process, reason understands then that the elliptical mechanics of the complementary field or space of matter or energy is compatible with spherical reality. From between both extremes, behold, who would doubt it, the supremely infinite ties of nature and still there are more, illustrious professor, a point in the middle of the sky will always be, especially at the moment of the collision or encounter, a point that is suitable for many fields. It arises there, and I have clearly demonstrated this in La Cosmica, the concurrence and incompatibility of different times for unique space. It is a conflict that natural law resolves ontologically by means of a widening of the sky. Given, of course, that all time corresponds to its own function of space, this cannot be otherwise. Within such a sky engendered in the effect and function of a multiple time is fulfilled now as always, I speak in agreement with my book La Cosmica, a very complicated mechanics generally oscillating between the pure and the quasi-hyperbolic of the space of constant negative curvature 
or without any relativistic link with the most cosmically surrounding areas of the celestial centers. Within these neighborhoods, the, ellip the elliptical form prevails, and consequently, the relative harmony from center to center in the midst of the great infinite consortium. It is that the Einsteinian coefficient is not, I repeat, as the genuine has believed, you yourself, illustrious teacher of hyperbolic prudence, but elliptical. The hyperbolic or quasi-hyperbolic reality is only of the sky and never of the stars, of the worlds and of matters in general, of matter in general. Whether it is in its physically gross form or in that of that energetic flash in the middle of the depths of your space, the non-linkage of the interstellar hyperbolic continuum with the elliptical gravitational forces of those that are cosmologically in the best neighborhood with the celestial concentrations, ipso facto implies an incompatibility of the two geometric forms, for which, according to my work, these are reciprocally impenetrable. The first in the supreme act of its information, as we've already said, produces a stretching of the sky in all directions as an increase in the three-dimensional capacity of intergravitational spaces and elliptical forms is why shouldn't we say it the geometric clash of two natures or the conflagration of two different mechanics but nevertheless continuous through a transition zone as a means of clamping between the two the sky, the super elliptical space, then produces for that ontological reason of its own three-dimensional increase, a certain cosmic push through the entire universe to the extent and in the form of that centrifugal force as the first condition of the interastral dynamics. It is the mechanics that must be fulfilled ipso facto of the relativistic truth for the conservation and guarantee of universal harmony or that for which within the great macrocosm no star will have time to collide with another. There is therefore a cosmological squeeze through the infinite that is the centrifuge and the centripetal between the heavens and the elliptical fields of the astral gravitation, the astral gravitational this is how Newtonian's gravitation, which has all its formal validity in Einstein's relativity, in Einstein's relativity, has however no truth within a purely relativistic universe. The statement of the law that expresses it and the numerical value of the masses are therefore very different, and all the modifications in this respect must come according to what is referred to and demonstrated in my work. I have demonstrated in it the classical falsehood of universal gravitation, and even if you like the cosmic impossibility of determining planetary masses, it is because as long as the classical concept is sustained within the realism of modern science, the dynamics of celestial systems only implies an inconceivable absurdity. But the weights, however, with very little sensible error, can be accepted as a non-incompatible cosmological truth. This work, which is the same one to which I have referred to my work, illustrious teacher, and which I have allowed myself to cite so many times before you, includes, after having demonstrated the Pythagorean form of Gaussian means, a thousand more things that I cannot make them explicit here because that would undoubtedly exceed the limits of this message. In the meantime, illustrious genius, receive the respect and consideration of a server who must always answer to you with these simple generals of truth, with these simple generals of law. Osvaldo Garcia de la Concha, professor of the National University of Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, former director of the Superior Normal School, Santo Domingo, November 13, 1929.